An expert in the law of Moses stood up and asked Jesus a question. Teacher, what must I do to have eternal life? Jesus answered, What is written in the scriptures? How do you understand them? The man replied, The scriptures say, Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, strength, and mind. They also say, Love your neighbors as much as you love yourself. Jesus said, You have given the right answer. If you do this, you will have eternal life. But the man wanted to show that he knew what he was talking about. So he asked Jesus, Who are my neighbors? Jesus replied, As a man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho, robbers attacked him. and grabbed everything he had. They so beat him up and ran off, leaving him half dead. A priest happened to be going down the same road. But when he saw the man, he walked by on the other side. Later, a temple helper came to the same place. But when he saw the man who'd been beaten up, he also went by on the other side. A man from Samaria then came traveling along that road. When he saw the man, he felt sorry for him and went over to him. He treated his wounds with olive oil and wine and bandaged them. Then he put him on his own donkey and took him to an inn where he took care of him. The next morning he gave the innkeeper two silver coins and said, please take care of the man. If you spend more than this on him, I will pay you when I return. Then Jesus asked, Which one of these three people was a real neighbor to the man who was beaten up by robbers? The teacher answered, The one who showed pity. Jesus said, Go and do the same. Yeah, there are heart-wrenching stories coming from Syria, but I found this uh, short video from the UN. Uh, where is Brad? Yeah, yeah. so it's kind of uh, no gore, no blood, but just some information. So we'll see it and then have a quiz to keep you awake. Okay. Yeah. In the heat and dust they come, carrying their belongings, their lives, and bags on their backs. They are Syrians. And as they cross the border at Akachale into Turkey, they become refugees. The stream has become a river, then a flood. Over four million Syrians are now refugees. One million have fled the bombs and blood in their country in just the last 10 months. 24,000 have escaped the fighting in Tel Abyad to Turkey last month. Some so young and others so sick that ambulances waited to take them from the border point. The numbers are staggering, but each number is a person, a story of suffering and loss. Taken together, they constitute a crisis of unprecedented magnitude. In the last year, Turkey has become the largest refugee hosting nation in the world. It takes care of over 2 million refugees. Over 1.8 million of them are Syrians. Turkey has built a network of camps while more than one and a half million Syrians live in villages, towns, and cities. The arc of suffering takes in Lebanon. 1,172,000 Syrians have sought refuge in a country of just four million people. Lebanon boasts the largest refugee population per capita in the world. Its social structures buckle under that enormous pressure. Jordan, where over 629,000 Syrians have fled. 
often to a grim life. 86% of refugees living outside camps struggle to exist below the poverty line of $3.20 a day. An increasing number are risking everything in perilous crossings of the Mediterranean in small smugglers' boats to reach Europe. But the overwhelming majority remain in the region, sliding further into abject poverty. The numbers rise relentlessly. UNHCR estimates that by the end of the year there could be 4,270,000 Syrians in exile. Billions will be needed simply to support them. But so far this year, a quarter of the humanitarian aid has been received. Much more is desperately needed for the millions of refugees and the millions more, 7,600,000 internally displaced in their brutalized country. The numbers are huge, and so is the need. How many refugees are there in the world today? What do you think? What's the right answer uh, we're talking about old refugees almost not only Syrians so yeah we have Afghans we have Iraqis we have Burmese etc so another one what is the largest refugee population in the US oh okay Syrians are still the smallest number here, okay? So, yeah, right, right, let me see. Yeah. Yeah. Vietnam is the second, really. Yeah, so, uh, Bosnia, too. In the night, they fled uh, ethnic cleansing, you know, remember that. And uh, the next one. So, which country takes, do the largest refugee population come from? Okay. I think that's about the West, really. So, uh, not only Syrian refugees, okay. So, Palestine, Syria, and then Afghanistan. Yeah. And, uh, you know, DuPage County is the most uh, diverse county. There there are some apartment complexes where there are 17 languages spoken, you know. So, it's really something. So, I think this is the easiest, maybe. Yeah. Yeah, right. Yeah, but uh, all over the world, there are, there are 12 million, really. And when we say refugee here in Lebanon or in Turkey, it doesn't mean that they have civil rights or they can work. No. They cannot do anything legally. They cannot work. They have no civil rights. They have to, if they don't have money and ha don't have relatives, they have to stay in tents and wait for something to happen, really. You know, many of them uh, think that they could come, uh, go back, but Usually they, they can't. And also those who are displaced within the country uh, face more problems because, like, I know a Syrian family we are in touch with over, uh, you call it Viber, anyway. So they are being starved to death, okay? And uh, the regime, you know, kind of puts a siege and over every place where they go. And they try to starve them to, the, to death, even inside Syria. Uh, so, we see a lot of men trying to cross uh, the ocean to Europe, but many people try to say, oh, they are all young men, and uh, etc., etc. Usually, when you see young men fleeing Syrians, uh, you should know that there is. Uh, there, there is dra military draft, so they run away from the draft because the regime wants to put them in the front lines and get them killed with ISIS or any other terrorist organization. Okay, so this is why uh, young uh, men, uh, I mean uh, uh, young adults, 17 or 18, would flee from Syria because they'll be drafted by force. Okay, so but. Actually, the majority are not young men. 
and they are really uh, women and children, okay? And uh, some people are really preying on them in Turkey, praying P-R-E-Y, not A-Y, okay? They are selling them uh, life jackets which are false. Inside there is nothing and they drown, you know? And I mean, this is really kind of uh, the evil that men do, as they say. Uh, okay, what's the average amount of time a refugee lives in a refugee camp? Uh, this I couldn't guess myself without help, really. Yeah. Especially the Africans, you know. I, I had a Sudanese yesterday. He's been running away for seven, 17 years. Uh, well, he left his country in the 70s, actually. So he, he grew up fleeing, you know from one country to another, but the last one is luckily the United States. Uh, so what country holds the most refugees? You, that's easy because of the movie, okay? Uh, right now it's uh, really Turkey, but per capita if you look at Lebanon, the Lebanese are four million people. They have two million Syrian refugees and one, one million Palestinian refugees. And then other, you know, a few thousand refugees from here and there, you know. So the, the number of refugees is really compared to the, more than half of the country, you know. It uh, cannot be managed anymore. Uh, so what does the Bible tell us about refugees? Do we have... Uh, I'm, I'm not going to talk politics here, but I mean... What should we do? The Bible says that we have to love refugees as ourselves. And uh, Rich? When a foreigner resides among you in your land, do not mistreat them. The foreigner residing among you must be treated as your native born. Love them as yourself, for you were foreigners in Egypt. This is Leviticus, okay? Yeah. Do not oppress a foreigner. You yourselves know how it feels to be foreigners because you were foreigners in Egypt. Yeah. Uh, so, so God loves refugees. Why? He defends the cause of the fatherless and the widow and loves the foreigner residing among you, giving them food and clothing. And you are to love those who are foreigners, for you yourselves were foreigners in Egypt. Is, is love just a feeling, you know? If you love somebody, you have really to sacrifice something, right? We ha you have to extend a helping hand. When you reap the forest, the harvest of your land, do not reap to the very edges of your field or gather the gleanings of your harvest. Do not go over your vineyard a second time or pick up the grapes that have fallen. Leave them for the poor and for the foreigner. And Jesus tells us, if you help a needy person, you are helping him. For I was hungry, and you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty, and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger, and you invited me in. I needed clothes, and you clothed me. I was sick, and you looked after me. I was in prison, and you came to visit me. So that's Matthew 25, right? Mm -hmm. So uh, when, when we hear about Sodom and Gomorrah, usually we think about sexual immorality, but God gives us Another reason why he uh, struck that, those two towns. Yep. Now this was the sin of your sister Sodom. She and her daughters were arrogant, overfed, and unconcerned. They did not help the poor and needy. Overfed. I mean, uh, Syrian refugees uh, work 12 hours a day for what costs us of uh, the cost of a uh, Starbucks for us, you know. I mean, that's, they live on the cost of a cup of coffee, you know, for us. And really, we are, really sometimes, I think, really we are overfed, right? Yeah, and uh, Jesus himself was a refugee. He escaped a massacre, right? Remember that? He escaped a massacre. And uh, the disciples after him, thank you, Rich. The disciples after him followed him in his footsteps. They wandered after they were filled with the power of the Holy Spirit in Jerusalem, they went out preaching the gospel 
to the end of the earth. And it was not cheap. Right? All of them died under torture and persecution, except St. John, right? We have with us uh, uh, Brother Sam Thomas. He's from South India. He called himself Thomas, but that's not his real family name, last name, really, because his grandpa speared St. Thomas. I, I always joke about it. St. Thomas went to India to, to uh, preach the gospel. So, Sam, you have to repent, okay, from your... Okay, yeah. So, today we really talk about compassion. We talk about refugees. We, we talk about loving our neighbor. But on the other hand, we also, I believe we need to find really a new way to defend our country. We need a new way to, def- to manage our nation. We need a new way to manage our lives and our relationships with others, whether they are foes or friends. Today, America has enemies more dangerous than communism and fascism. Okay? Uh, I don't want to go into politics, but I mean, you can imagine what I'm talking about. So from now on, you know, wishy-washy solutions don't work, won't work. Sweeping the dust under the carpet won't work anymore. Our uh, Christian theology, Lutheran theology, teaches us that there is something called vocation. As Christians, we have a vocation to defend our country against all enemies. A Christian soldier or a security officer uh, serving his country or her country is serving God as a pastor serves the church, but outside the world of the church. Maybe some of us do not know that Martin Luther, in 1529, when he was writing, the Turks were storming or trying to storm the gates of Vienna. In 1529, the Ottomans stood at the gates of Vienna. And Martin Luther said he invoked, uh, Christendom to defend all Christendom to defend uh, the borders of Christendom and actually the Poles were able to uh, deter the you know the Ottomans with the help of others but uh, at the same time Martin Luther did something else he took chunks from the Quran the Quran was only in Latin then and he translated those chunks from the Quran into German And he said every Christian should educate himself or herself in order to know how to reach Muslims. So, even though you have to defend your country and it's a vocation from God, also you have to show compassion and share the gospel with the lost, with your neighbor. This is why we have, we shouldn't really... uh, generalize when we see Muslims or Arabs. When a terrorist attack takes place, a knee-jerk reaction is not a Christian reaction. We need a spirit-filled reaction. As Christians, we have to love our enemies. We need Christians who shine like stars so that men would see their good deeds and glorify their Father in heaven. We need Christians who share the gospel with humility. Christians who preach Christ, not themselves. Christians who do not, who are not, do not sound self-righteous. Today, if you are, some of you really kind of uh, uh, attended the Bible study hour and, and uh, heard a Syrian convert tell his story. A story where that brother, new brother in Christ, found peace in the Prince of Peace. Last Christmas, we baptized two people here. One from Iraq, one from Iran. The Iraqis and the Iranians fought for eight years. Killed each other. They killed one million people. Today, they are sitting in the pews at Salam, worshipping the Prince of Peace. Only the Prince of Peace could do that. The Iraqi lady, she was divorced and she was going to kill her ex and commit suicide. 
before she came to Salam. Last Thanksgiving, I was driving her home after she spent Thanksgiving. She said, all the hate I had for him became forgiveness. I pray, even pray for him, for her ex. The other guy, an Iranian, he was driving on Lake Street, coming from Itasca at night. He had been coming to Salam for eight years, but he was ignoring, you know, the issue of baptism, you know. He, he, he learned everything, but baptism means the family, the clan will leave you. A heavy price for a clannish community like the Middle East. Other places you'll be killed, but here in the States is a problem, you know. So, that night, driving from Itasca on Lake Street, he was hit by lightning. Now, he thought it's lightning, but it was like a road to, to Damascus experience, and the lightning, he had the, the car stopped in his tracks, and he thought he was rear-ended or something. There was nothing. The light became a cross. He couldn't sleep. And uh, weeping all night. In the morning, 9 a.m., I received their call. Usually, you know, those, those people party till 2 in the morning. They don't wake up, you know, 9 in the morning. Uh, what's wrong? He said, I couldn't sleep. I, I want to talk to you. And uh, we baptize him here. So those two people found peace in the Prince of Peace. And nobody in the Middle East will find peace but in the Prince of Peace. America and other Western nations are spending billions of dollars on fighting wars around the world and the Middle East. But they are just dealing with the symptoms of evil human hearts. The gospel we teach, the gospel we have, deals with the heart of the problem, the evil human heart. We have a ministry of reconciliation, making disciples is our commission in this world. The problem is that I all, people wonder why when we, we, are, we, we are called to faith in Christ, why don't, doesn't He take us to heaven immediately? Because we have to do something here on earth. We have to make disciples. We have to shine like stars and so that people will see our good deeds and glorify our Father in heaven. This is why we are staying here. Our eternal life begins here, and we have to bring others, save them from darkness. But the problem is that we get distracted from the eternal, don't we? We spend most of our time massing earthly stuff. We are like this, like somebody trying to leave to leave footprints on a sandy beach. The tide will come and wipe them out. One day somebody will take your house. Somebody will take your car. Somebody will take your money. But what's done for Jesus will stay. As a poet said, only one life will soon be passed. Only what's done for Christ will last. There was a great philosopher, French philosopher, called Alexis de Tocqueville. I read this guy uh, decades ago, you know. I mean, I'm now 55, 56, you know. I read him in the 80s, maybe. I don't remember, but uh, he struck me as an original thinker. Last, this morning, uh, I couldn't sleep. I woke up at 2 in the morning. I thought, I, I want to add something to this, uh, you know, message. And I... Googled Alexis de Tocqueville and the church. And this is what I got. You know, I'm, I'm reading it because I, I have a bad memory now. I sought for the key to the greatness and genius of America in her harbors. I sought for her greatness in her fertile fields and boundless forests. I sought for the greatness of America in her rich mines and fast world commerce and sought for her greatness in public school system and institutions of learning. I sought for her greatness in democratic congress and her matchless constitution. Not until I went into the churches of America and, her po and heard her pulpits flame with righteousness did I understand the secret of her genius and power. America is great because America is good, he's saying. America is, 
is if America ceases to be good, America will cease to be great. America is good only because there is a church at every corner. Today, the church in America feels weak and marginalized, but we have to do our vocation. Making disciples of all nations and defending our country at the same time. Today, the church in America has a mission. We need to be aware of that. We cannot be lukewarm anymore. If we are in Christ, we have no fear. If we are in Christ the rock, our supposed weakness is infinitely more powerful than the strength of our enemies. Jesus gained the ultimate victory over the, on the cross for us. We need to believe in what Jesus says. The gates of hell shall not prevail against His church. Amen.